Yes, thank you very much for the kind introduction. This is joint work together with uh, Timo, who is in Germany, and um, Pierre, who was a student in Birmingham. And today I will present together with Flavio our paper Locket and Still Lose It on the insecurity of automotive remote keyless entry systems. So if you look at a typical car key, you have two main electronic components in there. One is the immobilizer, which is a passive RFID system running at 125 kilohertz with a range of a few centimeters maybe. And these immobilizers have a very long, or attacks on immobilizers have a very long history here at USENIC, so if you're interested, you can look into this. Today we'll speak about a system which has not been looked into too much, and this is the remote keyless entry system, the RKE system. These are these buttons here on the remote control that you press to open or uh, lock your car or to access a trunk also, or in the US sometimes sound the alarm. These are active UHF systems at high frequency with a higher range and they're unidirectional, so the remote just talks to the car basically. They can sometimes be integrated with the immobilizers and we have a so-called hybrid system or they can be completely separate. So, and we were curious, also partially motivated by unexplained cars, cases of car theft without signs of, or theft from locked cars without signs of forced entry, how this uh, may be possible and how secure these systems were. So back in the day when this was introduced, we had so-called fixed codes where you just sent a fixed UID and the button that was pressed um, to the vehicle and then the car would execute this action. And obviously such uh, systems are vulnerable to simple replay attacks. So uh, Oscar can just eavesdrop the signal from a high range in this case. We have high frequency systems replay the system and uh, open the vehicle. And the ranges are there in the range up to 100 meters, really. So these systems are obviously uh, not good. This is why industry has reacted and invented so-called rolling codes, which are based on cryptography now. So we have a shared secret both in the car and the uh, remote control. And how this is used, the shared secret is used to, in some way, authenticate, so encrypt or MAC maybe, a counter value together with the uh, pressed button. And then on every button pressed, this counter is uh, incremented to give freshness and to prevent relay attacks in this way. So if you want, you can think of it uh, as this, a nice circle. So you have some current counter values and only counter values in the future are accepted within some validity window. And the encryption then ensures that the adversary cannot simply uh, increments the counter himself, yeah. So there are many realizations how this is actually done in practice. That's just an illustration. So as said, Oscar has no uh, opportunities to break the system unless he does one of the following two things, and this can be either attack the cryptography or attack the key management, and in this presentation we'll uh, give examples for both cases where the texts are still possible. I will talk about the uh, key management part a bit more, Flavio about the crypto part. So a very brief history of uh, attacks on RKE systems. Around about in 2007, 2008, we have seen many attacks on key lock garage door openers. They are also rolling code based. First there was uh, crypt analysis, which however was sort of impractical in this keyless entry scenario because you needed two to the 16 codes to basically extract the key. And afterwards in 2008 we had uh, side channel attacks on the key diversification which were more realistic. A different line of research are attacks on so-called passive keyless entry systems. These are these keys where you do not have to press a button anymore. They are vulnerable to uh, relay. And then in 2014 we have seen a few attacks on actual vehicles. One was an attack by Cesare on around about 2000 till 2005 vehicle based on some mathematical techniques. And later there was uh, last year this roll jam attack, which is based on a combination of intelligent jamming and replaying. However, in the cases that we'll talk about, this will not apply since the button function is actually authenticated. So it's included in the cryptography. So if you eavesdropped a closed signal, you could not turn it into an open signal in our cases. This brings me to the first case study, which is a system employed by the VW Group. So for those who do not know, VW Group is formed of Volkswagen, Audi, Seat, Skoda, plus a few uh, luxury brands such as uh, Porsche. 
And all in all, they have uh, around about 10% worldwide uh, market share. So it's one of the leading automotive companies. The system is widely employed. The mobilizer system called Megamos has some history at Usenix. If you do not know, you can look into this. However, the RKE system is completely separate. So there's no Megamos used in the keyless entry system here. We have looked at vehicles between around about uh, 2000 or earlier and uh, today and found four main schemes which we call VW1 till VW4 in the following of the presentation. However, there are um, a few more remaining niche schemes where we suspect they are in a similar way uh, vulnerable. So when analyzing this remote keyless entry systems in general, you first need to eavesdrop signals and there are various opportunities for this. One is to use uh, software-defined radios, such as these very low-cost DVB-T sticks, or also on HackRF, maybe, USRP. The other option is to build uh, purpose-designed systems, like this Arduino board, which can be built for around about uh, $40, which can receive and transmit data, and is also, as you can see, uh, battery-powered. A typical VW rolling code would look like this. You have uh, some preamble at the beginning, then a start pattern, and then the actual uh, part carrying the data. So we looked at this a bit in a black box fashion and could not uh, really figure out what was going on, so we continued to reverse engineer ECU firmware. For this, we first had to find the correct ECU for each of the schemes VW1 to VW4, extract the firmware from the microcontroller, reverse engineer the cryptography using tools like yeah, IDA Pro, for those who know reverse engineering, this is uh, similar to the software world, and then uh, from there, we got access to the full cryptographic algorithms and also the utilized keys. So I'll only briefly uh, talk about two of these four schemes. One, these are the two more recent schemes. One is VW3. And we found out that the rolling code is basically constructed like this here. You have a cipher called ORT64, which you probably do not know. We later basically found the cipher in some uh, Atmel data sheets in a high-level fashion. We have not looked at it um, really deeply cryptographically. And this ORT64 cipher is then used to encrypt, encrypt the UID, the counter value, and the button value. And afterwards, the button value is again sent in clear text for some reason. What you already can notice is the UID is never sent in clear. So the car has first to decrypt to um, basically get all these values, which sort of suggests that something may be wrong with the key management here. And indeed, this key uh, K3 that you see is just the same key in all uh, vehicles made under this uh, VW scheme. So there's no key diversification at all being employed, and it's just one symmetric secret. It's also interesting to note that actually all VW3 cars have to decrypt all the codes in their vicinity. Um, this VW2 uh, system is just uh, same cipher, same system, slightly different packet format and a different uh, worldwide key. And the system before that, VW1, is just based on uh, linear shift registers, again with global secrets, so we did not have to uh, open the box of crypt analysis here at all. The newest system that we looked at is called VW4 users, if you compare to the uh, previous slide only the XTR cipher instead of ORT64, but nothing else had changed. So the cryptography is fine. It's a secure standard cipher. But again, we have one worldwide key K4 in, in this case. So in summary, this means the adversary can just eavesdrop a single signal, get the UID value, get the counter value, and from there and create a clone of the original remote control with this knowledge of, uh, of those global keys. And I'll also have a small video demonstration for you. Here you see a Volkswagen uh, Passat. And first of all, now the original owner um, opens the vehicle with his remote. Here we have open and close, but one uh, signal would just be uh, sufficient, basically. And now for demonstration purposes, we actually place the remote control on the car and have this uh, sophisticated eavesdropping and sending device. It's similar to the Arduino board. And uh, this has now eavesdropped the key and can generate future, uh, eavesdropped the signal and can, based on the global key, generate future signals such as open, close, open, close, and so on. 
So now the car is actually, this counter is um, four values ahead of the original remote. So how many times does the owner now have to press? Four, five, five actually. So you have to press five times such that the counter in the remote control again catches up uh, with, with, the key, uh, with the car. So on the fifth time the car works again with the original remote. This affects a large amount of uh, VW vehicles. This is a list of vehicles that we could actually identify. So you have um, Audi in <coughs> this list, you have um, Volkswagen, Seat, uh, Skoda. So in summary, probably most of the vehicles manufactured between 2000 or 95, however, and uh, today. The only um, exception is the newest platform. That's a Golf 7 or MQB, Modularer Querbaukasten, yeah, some German word a platform which allegedly um, uses better cryptography and more importantly, maybe better uh, key management actually. <laughs> so before I hand over to Flavio, just to summarize this part, we have seen the cryptographic algorithms are a bit improving over time from this LFSR to OR64 to uh, X tier. However, just secure crypto doesn't make a secure system if you have a bad key, manage key management. And in this case, we could just reverse engineer ECU firmware, get this global master keys, which makes the attack very uh, practical and very scalable. And as said, only the newest system, if you have such a vehicle, is allegedly more secure. So, so much for this uh, failures in key diversification. And now Flavio will tell you a bit more about problems with cryptography. Thank you. Hi, so we look into another widely used remote gear entry system, so-called HiTech 2. It's used uh, by several car makes, including uh, Alfa Romeo, Citroën, Nissan, Ford, Peugeot, Mitsubishi, Renault, Opel, among others. Um, in contrast to the, to the BWU systems, these do have a different key per, per car key. So um, we, we need to work with the, we, we need to develop some cryptanalysis for for retrieving the secret key. So back in, at Usenix 2012, uh, Verdult, Balash, and myself proposed uh, an attack against the HITECH2 immobilizer. The cipher was known uh, before, so, so we did some cryptanalysis. And this attack required knowing the UID of the, of the key, uh, required 136 authentication attempts from the car, and five minute computation on a laptop. Um, while uh, speaking with the manufacturers, uh, this attack was not deemed uh, really a practical car only for the, due to the, this first requirement that you have to gather the UID of the car key. But, and because of the immobilizer system is a passive chip, you, you need to be really in close proximity, typically two centimeters from the victim to, to read the UID of their key. So, so it was say, well, yeah, this is not really a concern. It's not that practical. Okay. Um, now in the remote keyless entry uh, context, uh, this, this HITECH2 uh, chip is, us is often integrating the, both the immobilizer and the remote keyless entry system in one chip, although they have different cryptographic keys. Um, but uh, the first thing we notice is that the UID is the same for both interfaces. So this allows you to eavesdrop the UID of, of the, for, for the immobilizer through the remote keyless entry system, but this you can do at a much larger range which, which uh, makes the, the immobilizer attack already a lot more powerful. Um, but yes, in the remote keyless entry context, 136 traces is it, not really practical, I would say, because you would have to wait so many times that the owner pushes the, the car key and you will have to be listening in there. So you, you, you wouldn't deem that as, as a practical attack. So we, we went back to the drawing board and, and worked a bit harder on the, on the attack and we developed a completely new attack uh, which is now correlation based. But first we needed to figure out what the protocol, the authentication protocol actually was. We knew what the cipher was. So we start uh, simply uh, observing at the signals being sent and just, just trying uh, trial and error until we got the, 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 right, uh, the right guesses. Um, here is what the, what the, what the protocol does. It's, it's, it's quite simple. It sends a UID, a button and a number, uh, a counter value, and then a MAC of all the previous values, and then a CRC, which is just a checksum to detect uh, transmission errors over the air. Um, this, this MAC is basically uh, just uh, 
some key stream generated by a stream cipher, which is initialized with, with all the UID, the button on the counter, and the, and the shared key. OK? So this attack that, we, that I'm going to describe now requires a 4 to 8 traces, and which you can collect easily, as, as uh, David just mentioned, with uh, an Arduino, inexpensive Arduino device we built ourselves, which cost uh, about $40. Um, if you want to speed up this harvesting these traces, you could do uh, uh, somehow a neat trick of uh, uh, reactive jamming. So I, I mentioned that there is a checksum at the end of the message. So if you are listening with, the, with this device uh, until the last bit of the Mac, and then you start sending a, a lot of noise, this will jam the checksum, and then the car will ignore that message. But yet, you were able to record this, this whole trace, because the checksum you can compute yourself. So uh, two things may happen. I, either the, the, own, the car owner realizes that the car didn't blink the lights or so, and then pushes the key again, and then you, you get an extra trace for free. Or the owner doesn't realize that the car didn't receive the signal and walks away with the car unlocked. In either case, the adversary wins. Uh, so I'm going to now, I have to abstract a bit of the crypto details, but I will try to give you a bit of the flavor of the attack and how does this work. Um, this is the HITECH 2 cipher. As you can see, it's based on a 48-bit LFSR. And, and a, 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 a nonlinear Boolean function, which produces one, key to, oh, one, key, one bit of key stream with every clock tick. Um, as, as I said, the, the cipher, as you can imagine, is initialized with all the values, the counter, the button number, the, the symmetry key, uh, and then it's run to produce this, this MAC, which is what gives you the security in the protocol. So how the, the attack uh, goes as follows. You first will guess a 16-bit window there on the, on the left side of the LFSR. And we, we are going to score our guesses based on correlation, as I, as I hinted before. And we will compute for each guess a score based on the ratio of inputs to this Boolean function that produce the correct uh, key stream bit. And then we will start shifting this window around and, and keep on computing the, the, the score for every offset. And, and, and then we, we really do this for, for, for each offset, and, and we go on like that. Once we, we have all the score, we take the average score for the guess, and then we, we, we keep a, a table of fixed length, and we will discard the, the guesses with, with, with low score. And then we will move on, and we extend this window by one bit, now 17 bits, 18 and 19, and so on and so forth, until we get all the 48 bits from the internal state of the cipher. Uh, this sounds a bit uh, complicated, and actually I'm simplifying really a lot, because when you want to do this on many traces, you need to compute the key stream and, and, and to correct the, the counter, the difference in the counter value in the internal state. But I just want, I'm just happy if, if, if you walk out of here with a bit of the flavor of how the attack works. Um, so this runs uh, in about one minute on this laptop I'm using now to present, so no, no specialized hardware whatsoever, and computes the 48-bit secret key. <laughs> Um, there are a few practical limitations, um, something I didn't mention before. In the authentication protocol, only the 10 least significant bits of the counter are being sent over, over the air, but all 28 bits of the, of the counter are being used to initialize uh, the cipher and for, for the authentication protocol. So you, we need to get, guess this whole counter, but this is surprisingly easy, because uh, for all the cars we tested, which are quite a few, um, all the keys start from zero. So, and 10 bits is, is 1,024 key pushes. So, yeah, it's not so hard to guess how many thousand times a victim has pushed the button, especially if it's a recently, uh, relatively new car, if it's a car from this year. Uh, you're pretty sure the, the most significant bits will be either zero or one, right? Um, and for all the, the cars we tested, the, count, the, the most significant bits were at most 10. So you can basically run the attack so many times uh, and, and, and find out. Another problem we found is that, well, if, if you run th this attack that I just described on the immobilizer, then four traces are enough. Because the, in the authentication protocol for the immobilizer, you, ha you have random nonsense. Um, with this, because here you, you have a counter, there's only one bit 
changing often in, 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 the, in the state. And you can see I have a, a few real traces from a real car key. And if you see, there are two consecutive uh, values there. And if you look at the Mac, you would expect a cryptographic Mac to be completely re-randomized. But if you look at those values uh, with the naked eye, you can spot that they are really, they look pretty much alike. So there are only a few bits different. So the cipher is so bad that it makes our attack uh, less efficient because we, we only get a few bits of information with, with consecutive traces. So that means that in the context of remote key entry system, we need a few more traces, typically eight, to recover the secret key. Um, OK, so I'm going to show you a demo now of this attack from beginning to end. Uh, this is my car there. As you can see, there is the Arduino board connected to the laptop. I'm going to first collect a few traces. You can see on the screen, probably, there, the trace is appearing on the, on the laptop. Now we will run the attack. This is information. This will take a minute, so we're going to speed up one minute uh, to the juicy part. Um, there we go. That, that is the key. And now we are going to program that key and the counter value that we observe on the traces into this Arduino board, uh, which, has two, which has two buttons, one to open the car and one to lock it. As you can see, the car cannot tell the difference between this Arduino board and the, and the original key. All right, so um, we tested this um, this attack on, on many, in many uh, vehicles, which we got from friends and, uh, and colleagues which w who were <laughs> kind enough to <laughs> lend us their car. Um, as you can see, it's quite a list, some 18 vehicles. And if, um, if you have a look there, there are quite a few 2016 cars. Um, so yes, we are running out of time. So I will just move to the conclusions. Um, I wanted to, to say that, uh, as, as always, we engaged in responsible disclosure. We informed uh, the Volkswagen Group of our findings back in December 2015, and NXP Semiconductors, the, the manufacturers of the HITECH 2 transponder, back in January 2016. And I can say that the communication has been uh, friendly and uh, constructive. Um, so, um, yes, it is a bit uh, surprising that uh, HITECH 2 uh, is still being used in, in vehicles from this year since the HITECH 2 cipher uh, has been shown to have deficiencies uh, for quite, quite a few years now. Um, and yes, and we hope that the, this research will um, explain several cases, mysterious cases of, of theft where there was no sign of, of forced entry, but yet since things were missing from cars or the cars themselves, and then the insurance was puzzled or, or was skeptical about the, the, those claims. Thank you. Um, first, an easy technical question. The counters, are they different for each UID, or is it one for the, the, for the car? Sorry, the, the question was if the counters are different for each uh, remote. Yes, essentially, yes. Yes, yeah, they are different, of okay. course. Otherwise, yeah. you would have always, if your wife opened your car, you would have that's to press uh, 10 times okay. again. Yeah. That's, uh, that's what I thought. The yeah. other question is, um, you might know the answer or not want to answer, but uh, are you aware whether these systems were designed by the engineers within the automotive industry, or were they, was it uh, uh, outsourced, or was it some other company, that, some technology that they bought in? Um, so, usually these companies have um, some suppliers that design the systems. We don't know if it was to the specification of the car companies or if they just externally bought it. Okay. With, the, with the Hitech 2 system, um, I think it's a system basically specified by NXP originally. Okay. But the automotive manufacturer is of course free or was free to also modify the systems. Yeah, sometimes they tweak, it. They tweak them a bit. Thank I've you. seen some small differences. So regarding uh, the Volkswagen, um, I mean, the immobilizers, they typically use different keys uh, per key, right? 
So there, there must be a mechanism in place to, uh, to uh, roll out individual keys per key fob. So has, when you communicated with Volkswagen, have they given you any explanation why they are using one worldwide key? No. <laughs> I mean, how, how stupid is that? <laughs> no. We were and also, the, uh, when we initially looked at the systems, we were also very surprised to see this. And we have never found any easy explanation. I mean, no. I mean, the only lame excuse could be that they don't have a mechanism to roll out the keys into the key fobs, but I mean, for the immobilizers, they, this has to be there. Yeah, the, the immobilizer system in Volkswagen is really completely separate. So you have this glass transponder, which has no connection to the RKE system. So probably that's the reason that they uh, didn't have this hybrid chip. Okay. Yeah. Simply yeah. stupid. High Tech 2 system has a, a, a key per, per car key, let's say, a different key. So actually, I also have a question. So can you elaborate a little bit uh, on your uh, experience with responsible disclosure, especially you know, uh, comparing this, uh, how things have changed comparing to your previous experiences with the Megamos uh, uh, attack? Yes, so by now we, we, we knew the technical people within the, within the companies, and, and that helps a lot. So it, always get, getting to a company through the technical uh, persons help a lot, and they understand uh, why we are doing this, and then, then the, the climate is very different. Yeah. All right, great. So if there are no more questions, let's thank the speakers.